Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. We enjoyed very much. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Darwin Conwell. Uh, he's going to be speaking on exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And Dr. Conwell is the chief of GI at uh, Ohio State and uh, almost needs no introduction. He's really the man when it comes to endoscopic pancreatic function testing, and it really was a big innovation. So thanks a lot for joining us, Dr. Conwell. Good morning. I'm going to give you just some, um, some points on uh, exocrine pancreas insufficiency, and I'm glad to be here today. I'm told to point this back there, and it worked. Good. So um, I like to start things off with a, with a case, and I'm really glad to be here today and talk to some of these uh, bright young minds and see where we're going in the, in the field. I'll leave you with some research gaps and opportunities for you to study as um, pancreatologists in the future. So let's, let's go over this case, 53-year-old uh, male with chronic uh, calcific uh, pancreatitis, has intractable pain, it's about a nine out of 10 uh, in severity. Um, one way of classifying this pain would be a, a mon type B, which is a constant um, pain uh, at a very high level that's, that's unrelenting. Patient had a recent uh, pancreatic uh, jejunostomy. Uh, it was successful, the pain decreased uh, markedly. Oh, yesterday was mentioned about a uh, pusto versus a, a fry. I love a fry procedure. The problem is getting surgeons that can do a fry uh, procedure these days, but a fry is a wonderful operation. Uh, three months after surgery, he was referred uh, for loose stools uh, in our pancreas uh, clinic. Um, uh, this patient described the stools as uh, there were some oil slicks um, in the uh, toilet bowl. And these are questions that you have to ask them. You know, do you see, um, do you see oil in the toilet bowl water? Uh, do your stools uh, stick uh, to the porcelain? Is it difficult uh, to flush your stools? Do you have to flush multiple uh, times? And they'll start telling you things like, oh, yeah, uh, that, I noticed that. What does that mean? Well, that's, those are oily uh, stools. Um, it's very important. Uh, you can ask the spouse, uh, is there some um, smell? Uh, is, is the flatus that they now pass, is it, has it changed? And so these are things that suggest uh, exocrine pancreas uh, insufficiency. So common uh, causes of this include severe acute pancreatitis, and of course, advanced chronic pancreatitis is what we um, think about a lot in this, in this arena, but also patients with pancreas cancer um, can have this pre or post uh, surgery, and of course, cystic fibrosis, um, we, we all know a lot of these, uh, these children have um, really bad exocrine insufficiency. Um, now, this is just a representation of a CT scan showing uh, very damaged um, calcified uh, pancreas, um, an MRCP showing uh, this really dilated duct with side branch um, uh, dilations consistent with um, chronic pancreatitis. And of course, here's an EUS with a very dilated uh, duct with some shadows uh, consistent with chronic pancreatitis and calcifications and a H&E uh, uh, specimen showing uh, scarring uh, in the pancreas. It's important for you to understand normal uh, fat uh, digestion. Uh, one of the things that we have to understand is that when you um, eat a meal, I know there's a cephalic and there's a gastric and there's an intestinal phase um, to a pancreas uh, secretion. And what's really important is that uh, pH um, mon modifies the secretin uh, release in the enterocyte of the small bowel and uh, proteins and fat um, alter the uh, cholecystokinin release from enterocytes in the uh, small bowel. And both of these act on the pancreas secret and causes uh, pancreatic ductal secretion of bicarbonate and water. And of course, cholecystokinin causes astronaut cell secretion of a protein rich uh, fluid. Now, lipase uh, is critical for the maintenance of a normal uh, nutrition. And there's a lack of redundancy. You know, when you talk about proteins, carbohydrates, and fat uh, digestion, of course, amylase is found in the salivary glands, but also in the pancreas. So you can digest carbohydrates uh, that way with uh, salivary amylase in case your pancreas is not working as well. So that can help accommodate for some of that uh, carbohydrate digestion. Protein digestion, of course, uh, your pancreatic trypsin digests that, but of course you can also have um, pepsin and hydrochloric acid from the stomach that will help in protein digestion. But very importantly, fat digestion comes from lipase, primarily from the stomach. There's a little bit of gastric lipase, but doesn't really uh, play much of a role. So dietary fat uh, is absorbed by uh, lipase, and that's the reason why you can actually uh, assess the degree of pancreas damage or the degree of pancreas insufficiency based on um, how much you malabsorb uh, fat. 
So of course, when you eat um, a fatty meal, remember that um, lipids are converted into micelles that gets absorbed across uh, the brush border of the small intestine, and of course, chylomicrons are formed, and these go into the uh, into the lacteals. This is a very important um, article, a landmark article that uh, most of you um, may or may not be familiar with, but you should get familiar with. And this is a New England Journal report from um, uh, Gene DeMagno years and years ago looking at um, lipase um, output and the degree of uh, steatorrhea. And this is the reason why we know that as you lose, you have a lot of reserve uh, in pancreas, the uh, lipase output from the pancreas. And once you get to around 10%, you start to really spill a lot of fat into your um, into your uh, into your stool, and so you need about uh, 90,000 uh, USPs, which is about 30,000 um, international units uh, of lipase to help you uh, maintain normal uh, digestion of uh, fat. So, what are the clinical manifestations of, of EPI? Uh, this can have vague uh, symptomatology. Early on, you can have abdominal bloating and cramping, late, a lot of loose, uh, malodorous uh, stools. And of course, you can have fat soluble vitamin deficiency, um, metabolic bone disease, which I think is a really hot topic um, right now. And there's a lot of work that can be done there, impaired uh, quality of life. And of course, one of the major problems we have is a challenge in the diagnosis, which we will spend some time talking about today. So this is a, um, a paper that uh, Phil Hart uh, put together from one of the APA meetings. He gave a talk on challenges with uh, the management of EPI. And this is a fishbone diagram um, that he put together. And we want to thank Dr. Go for um, uh, recommending that he put this uh, together uh, in a publication. But I think it really summarizes a lot of things that we uh, face when we're treating patients and considering EPI as a diagnosis. First of all, you know, there's a, there's a um, a failure to identify uh, at-risk uh, patients because they have nonspecific symptoms and there's a, we have poorly defined uh, high-risk populations that actually get uh, this uh, disorder. Uh, there can be a failure of pancreatic enzyme uh, supplementation, especially with medication non-compliance because the patients have to take a lot of uh, enzymes to help with their um, digestion. We'll talk about how much enzymes you really need to take uh, in practical real life. Um, there's uh, some lack of evidence um, supporting how much you give and, and guiding the dosing. Um, there's a failure to diagnose EPI um, because, you know, the ideal test is accurate, um, it's very convenient, it's widely applicable, um, but that test uh, does not exist. So we have surrogates with different strengths and weaknesses along, along these uh, characteristics. There's a failure of, um, of adjunct uh, therapy. Uh, we have to understand that sometimes gastric acidity impacts your digestion. Uh, patients may have bacterial overgrowth based on what you eat that also may impact this. So there's a suboptimal management of EPI is pretty commonly uh, seen. And in your pancreas clinics, you're gonna need to be uh, mindful of this and know what to measure and monitor in your patients as you follow them uh, over time. And we'll talk about that. So as I said, the perfect test is accurate in early disease. It's non-invasive, it's widely applicable, easy to perform, and the ability to monitor uh, adequacy of your uh, therapy. So let's go through the test. So quantitative fecal fats, the gold standard, um, a five-day uh, 100-gram fat diet is recommended. Three, the last three days you collect stool and you measure the amount of, of fat uh, per 24 hours and over seven grams is abnormal. Now, I've, I've used to order this test a lot when I was in Cleveland and it was very common for the microbiology lab to kind of to lose this sample downstairs. So that was, um, it happens, it, it does. I mean, because they got these paint cans. I mean, the real test is, you know, they got paint cans of stool in their refrigerator and they bring these cans in. It's kind of not, um, the samples uh, conveniently can get lost. Um, so um, test characteristics of this is, well, this is not feasible and routine clinical practice. And we use this in our GCRC and stuff. So this is not really a, a feasible test outside of research, but it is the gold standard for um, drug, um, uh, for, for, for the FDA and approval of drugs. So you have to have this available if you're uh, in, in research uh, centers. So it's accurate. Um, it's non-invasive, but it's not widely uh, applicable. It's not easy um, to perform. And, uh, and you can monitor um, Therapy, but it's it's really um, 
challenging uh, clinically. So, so we have these surrogate gold uh, standards for EPI. So this is a hormonal stimulation test. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about pancreas function testing, but I will say that it's accurate in early disease. It's probably the most accurate test we have in early disease. But the problem is, of course, um, it is invasive, okay? And it's not widely applicable, despite, despite the fact I've been preaching EPFT, EPFT. You know, we don't use it uh, that often a lot of times now that we have um, advances in MRI, MRCP with sequencing images and things. So uh, it's definitely out there uh, to use, but a lot of people have not uh, adopted it uh, yet. Uh, it, I think it's easy to perform. It's just an upper endoscopy, but um, it's still um, uh, it's, it's still invasive. Um, and your ability to monitor adequacy of therapy, you, you can't do that with the standard uh, EPFT anyway. The mixed triglyceride breath test is not available um, in the U.S. And I know there's, there's some uh, research ongoing now trying to develop a breath test for uh, pancreas insufficiency. The problem is breath tests take a long time to do. Um, the, the mixed triglyceride breath test is a very, very, very good test. And we'll talk about this, but it's not available uh, in the United States. And Dr. Dominguez Munoz has done some very good studies with this test. And I'll show you um, how, how, how I think wonderful this test is. And I have tried twice uh, to get this test um, to the market here in the U.S., and I have failed miserably um, two times, so I, I'm, I'm done. Um, I, even, I even went to Sweden uh, trying to get this test brought to the U.S. I'm, I'm completely done trying. Um, so anyway, um, fecal elastase, um, this is the test that we now pretty much use, um, but it, it, is it, it's not accurate in early disease. It is not invasive. It's widely available. It's easy to perform. Um, you can't really monitor. Uh, it's not. It, you, you'll see the ability to monitor the adequacy of therapy um, is not there, but it's the test that we use. It has some limitations. I'm going to talk to you about it because you will be ordering it probably quite a bit um, in some of your patients, but there's some things you have to be uh, aware of. So this is the summary that goes over um, fecal elastase of values in a, in a whole variety of diseases. And I want to caution you in IBD, uh, IBS, celiac disease, because these are uh, malabsorptive, um, can be malabsorptive problems, but also people with IBS can have um, you know, loose uh, bowel movements. And remember, a fecal elastase is a concentration uh, measurement. So you need to have a formed um, solid stool uh, to measure a fecal elastase. So if the patient, um, you give them the fecal elastase kit and they go home and it comes back very, very abnormal, um, you have to be very careful. You have to ask them. I know Peter Banks and I would always say, okay, I need a formed stool. I need a solid stool. And when we got the result back, we would ask them, what did the stool look like when you uh, returned it in? And we would, we would document that because you really uh, need a, a form. So if they have diarrhea, it's going to be abnormal. And that doesn't mean they have extra pancreas insufficiency. So you have to be very careful when you order um, this test. So this is just one um, paper that talks about some of the inaccuracies that you can get into with fecal elastase. So if you're using cut points of 200 or 100 um, plotted against um, fecal fat, of, you know, five-day five day of 100-gram fat diet with a three-day collection of standards uh, and measuring the coefficient of fat absorption, if you use 200 as a cutoff for fecal elastase or 100 as a cutoff for fecal elastase in a group of surgical uh, patients, what you see is once you get, um, when you're below 200, not bad, but once you get below 100, look at this wide range of um, fecal fats. And so in, in this surgical series, they felt that a fecal elastase was not very uh, helpful once it's below 100 because you get all this variability. And I'm not sure why there's so much variability here, but uh, this is 82 uh, patients. So be very careful. So one test by itself does not make the diagnosis. You have to have the right patient um, population. You have to have the right symptoms. And you have to combine um, things uh, together to make a diagnosis. So be very careful when you're interpreting uh, your fecal uh, elastase uh, values. And don't just blindly get it. I would discourage um, uh, people from getting fecal elastases and patients have no evidence or no uh, risk factors for uh, pancreatic uh, disease. People, people with IBS and functional bowel disease can have low values because they may have uh, diarrhea and, and this puts you down the wrong path of, uh, of, trying to, of treating these patients. One other adjunct that may be helpful um, is EUS elastography. I'm not an uh, advanced endoscopist, but this is looking at um, these median strain ratios um, in EUS plotted against um, the probability of having an abnormal, um, abnormal uh, um, 
EPI, fecal fat. And what you see here is a, there's, a, there's a definitely a direct uh, correlation. And they've come up with a, um, come up with a strain ratio that greater than 4.5 has 87% of uh, 87% that have EPI. Um, and so EUS, elastography, potentially could be an adjunct um, for the diagnosis of EPI in the right patient. A lot of times they do get um, EUS uh, imaging, and how you interpret that is you have to be very careful also uh, with the EUS interpretation, but this may be something to help you in regard to um, studying patients, and I think more research needs to be done, obviously, uh, in this, because it's not the standard of care. So let's go back to our patient. So this 53-year-old um, uh, patient with calcific chronic pain, who you see in your pancreas clinic after having a successful um, Pusteau uh, procedure. So um, uh, a uh, Sudan stain, which is a qualitative uh, fecal fat to a lot of uh, fat. Who's ever ordered a Sudan stain in here? Hands up. Let me see. Everyone doesn't have gray hair that did that. Okay, good. I'm glad to see that. So this is another this is another sample that can get lost in your lab too. Um, so you tell them give you just a just a random a random stool sample, send it down for a Sudan stain, and you'll get these. Um, you see these. Um, fat droplets, uh, and, that, and that's positive. Uh, now, your fecal, the pancreatic elastase uh, in this patient was also um, abnormal. And this is not to gross you out, but we're, you know, we're, this is what we do, you know? So we, we look at stools, so, um, and we're gastroenterologists, so. But this is what you need, you need a form stool. Now, if you look very carefully at this stool, uh, you can see there's oil around here, and uh, this is a fatty stool. And it smells bad, I can tell you. All right, so, um, so the Sudan stain was positive. The elastase um, was 80. So the diagnosis, of course, um, is pancreas excrement insufficiency. Um, so, um, so how do I treat um, uh, pancreatic uh, steatorrhea? Why is this important? What's the long-term sequelae? So this is really you know, a teaching session for you all. So why are we up here talking, uh, talking about this? Who cares, right? Well, I'm gonna tell you why it's important. So it's important to understand, um, uh, you need to understand the difference between coded and uncoded pancreas enzymes and what exactly they do. It's important to know that you know, lipase gets irreversibly damaged by gastric acidity. And that's the reason why we coat um, pancreas enzymes to kind of get them into the intestine. And there's a time release um, after that. You have to understand that um, uncoated pancreas enzymes actually can shut down CCK release from the small intestine. That's a really a nice board question. So some of the early studies that Dr. Toskis did talked about using uh, uncoated pancreas enzymes to help decrease uh, pain in chronic pancreatitis because you would decrease CCK stimulation of the pancreas and decrease pancreas secretion. So that may decrease pain. So a nice board question would be something like, well, which is better for treating steatorrhea, a coded or an uncoated pancreas enzyme? And the answer would be a coded enzyme because you need the lipase protected from the gastric acidity. So which enzyme will be better for treating pain in chronic pancreatitis? And the answer would be an uncoated uh, preparation because you wanted to decrease CCK stimulation and stimulation of uh, the pancreas. So that's a little physiologic uh, caveat uh, for you to understand. Uh, proton pump inhibitors, we'll talk about those. Also, um, what do you do in patients that have really, really bad um, pancreatic steatorrhea and they're not responding as well to optimal uh, therapy? You've optimized the therapy. Uh, MCT oil uh, should be given a supplement in their diet. And this tastes absolutely terrible. And so I'd recommend there are some, um, uh, some um, you can add, add some um, flavor packets uh, to this. So, so peptamin is 70% um, MCT oil. So that's a supplement you can uh, give your patients. So let's talk about um, this pancreas exocrine insufficiency in regard to physiology. And this really is the breath test that Dr. Dominguez Munoz uh, has developed. And this is a direct correlation with the coefficient of fat absorption. So this is a very, very, very good test. I'm not gonna go into the background of that, but just remember, take that for, for what it's worth and, uh, and be a believer. All right, so this is um, targeted um, therapy personalized therapy. Uh, so what they did in a group of patients with chronic pancreatitis was measured their um, mixed triglyceride uh, breath test. Um, and then they gave them enough enzymes and kept repeating the test until they normalized the test for each individual patient. So each patient has different levels of uh, insufficiency and different breath test results, but they gave them enough enzymes to normalize the breath test result. And in some patients, they had to give up to 80,000 
uh, international units of pancreas enzymes, and also in some patients, they gave them uh, proton pump inhibitors to shut down gastric acidity to allow them to, for the enzymes to be protected, the lipase to be protected. So now this is very important because what did they what did they find? They found that after a year of this optimized therapy for each individual patient, that your their body weight, their retinal binding protein, their serum prealbumins all went up. All right, with this optimized therapy. And I think this is very uh, important. We don't have this test available, but I think one of the things you're gonna to wanna to follow in your patient is nutritional uh, parameters. Just being obese and overweight is not the answer. A lot of them are gonna be uh, overweight, but getting at some of these protein um, uh, calorie uh, malnutrition uh, numbers and getting some idea of really where they are nutritionally by measuring some of these serum markers will be very important as you follow the patients over time because you're gonna be seeing them. I see most of my chronic pancreatitis patients twice a year. Um, so it's gonna be important for you to um, know what to follow uh, in these patients, and this is a this is a good thing to think about. So, why do we measure this? Well, of course, we want to recognize extra insufficiency because it does have an associated morbidity and mortality, and of course, fat soluble vitamin deficiency, vitamin A, D, E, and K um, are are important. If you start measuring these in your patients, they'll be abnormal, especially the vitamin A and the vitamin D will be abnormal. Um, so, one um, point I want to make is that inflammation. Um, induces an imbalance between uh, osteoclast and osteoblast activity. And this comes from an IBD paper that looks at this uh, imbalance that rank ligand mediated um, phenomenon with osteoclast and osteoblast. So you, there's more breakdown with osteoclast uh, than buildup uh, with osteoblast in a chronic inflammatory uh, condition. So if you look at chronic pancreatitis and why is there some conversation about metabolic bone disease um, is because they, you know, they, they, they smoke, there's alcohol, half of them are female, there's a chronic inflammatory state, there's malabsorption of vitamin D. All these things are starting to add up to, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe these people have got some bone, um, bone problems. And if you look at the pediatric literature, cystic fibrosis, they have a lot of uh, bone disease, and it's all related uh, to this. So when I was uh, in Boston, I was very interested in this, and uh, we actually looked to see if there was a high prevalence, because the end point really is fracture. You're trying to keep people from having a hip fracture. And it's hard to look at, in a retrospective database, patients with chronic pancreatitis that have had a DEXA scan, because there's a referral bias, because you don't usually refer a person with chronic pancreatitis for a DEXA scan unless they already have malabsorption or weight loss, and so there's a referral bias, and you're gonna skew the prevalence of bone disease in that patient population. But we looked at fracture as a hard endpoint to get some idea, is there a signal there that says that chronic pancreatitis patients may have osteopenia, osteoporosis, and of course, you recognize that's important because you don't want them uh, to break a hip. And once you break a hip, that's a big problem, as we all know. It really impacts your um, mortality and your, your, your uh, mortality. Uh, so the aim was to compare the prevalence of fracture in uh, controls and chronic pancreatitis, and there's a group of high-risk GI illnesses that predispose you to bone disease, such as celiac disease and uh, Crohn's disease and, and, and cirrhosis. And also we were to look at the, uh, we we're going to compare the fracture prevalence in these high risk groups where there's actually um, the AGA as, as, as screening guidelines for uh, bone disease, for bone health in these patients and compare it to chronic pancreatitis for which there are no screening guidelines, but we're all talking about it. Um, what did we find? We found that the fracture prevalence, uh, this was 3,000 uh, patients. Now this was done by ICD-9 coding, and that's not the most accurate um, it's got some problems with coding, but at least it's, um, it's a signal. It's not the definitive uh, answer, but what we're seeing is that about 4.8% of prevalence of fractures in chronic pancreatitis patients. And how does that compare to controls, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, post gastrectomy and cirrhosis? So it's right there in alignment uh, with those, um, those diseases. And so the odds of fracture was about 4.4, so it was um, comparable to other high-risk uh, diseases. And this is a paper that we published uh, several years ago that the prevalence of low trauma fracture and chronic pancreatitis is comparable with other high-risk uh, GI illnesses. We later looked at a VA data set because I was concerned about, you know, can we somehow eliminate some of the risk factors? And one of those was just being female gender, and we found that in males, still hip fractures was three times higher in chronic pancreatitis than controls. 
So what do you do here? I think you measure uh, pancreas, I, I think you measure fecal elastase with some of the caveats I told you about. Uh, you're gonna to need to give enzymes and you need, you need to give them probably large uh, dosages. Understand why you would use um, a proton pump inhibitor for lipase protection. Understand why you would use an enteric coated preparation. We talked about that. Um, new data, we're looking for new data, uh, new drugs, um, standardization um, of, of therapy. Okay, so one of the things I think is um, important is um, this paper, and a lot of people that are in the audience, hello, great, a lot of people that are in the audience uh, were involved in this um, NIDDK workshop, and, and Dana Anderson has, has really done a marvelous job at putting together some of these workshops on Wednesdays before uh, Pancreas Fest, and how many people are going to Pancreas Fest? All right, how many people have not registered for Pancreas Fest? Come on. Okay, you need to register for Pancreas Fest, all right? And, and, and why is that? How many people are registered for the APA? How many people are going to the APA? It's in Hawaii, it's in Maui, all right? You need to go to the APA. All right, so, I mean, if, you, if you're going to really study the pancreas, you need to get around people that talk about the pancreas. You get around people that love the pancreas. For whatever reason, we love the pancreas. And don't ask me why, I just do, all right? And so, my 10th grade science project was on the enzymatic processes of digestion. Go figure. Go figure. Superior, well, all kinds of, can you imagine? I mean, who knew, right? And no one in my family was a doctor. I have no idea why I made my mom make a roast beef, and I chewed it up, sent my dad to medical school in West Virginia to get pepsin and hydrochloric acid, and I sat there and I had this little vortex thing we made, um, and I talked about you know, protein digestion. My mom made these beautiful posters for me. It's unbelievable. But, you know, who knows? But we love the pancreas. But um, so you need to, if you're going to get in this field, you need to understand there are research gaps. And Dr. Uh, Gorlick Levy was some great, there's some research gaps. There's some things you can go after and study. And a lot of people are talking about this because we can't do it all. You know, we can't study it all. We need young people with minds and energy to study uh, some of these things. And there's still a lot of holes and unanswered uh, questions. I would encourage you to um, read um, this paper. A lot of people who are in this audience uh, yesterday and today were involved in this, but there are some, it's, we need to improve uh, and develop an accurate assessment of maldigestion, EPI, we need a simpler, less invasive uh, tools to measure uh, duct cell function, and go through this um, paper, and there are questions that you can answer, and the grant People that are reviewing your grants uh, are pancreas people. They understand this. This is where this is what you reference uh, in your grant application. This was a group of scientists that got together and said, "Here are the gaps in knowledge." And so, when you write your specific aims page, you say, "I'm addressing this gap in knowledge here." You know, from this is very. So you'll get. You gotta, you gotta, it's a good step for getting funding because a lot of people on this paper, somebody here will probably be reviewing your grant. All right. Anyway, so. What are we doing to get further along in our understanding of uh, chronic pancreatitis uh, specifically is this uh, study that Diraj Yadav has, uh, has championed and got us all uh, very tired from many, many hours of um, work on. It's called the uh, Prospective Evaluation of Chronic Pancreatitis for Epidemiologic and Translational Studies called the PROCEED study. And this is a U01 consortium with a lot of centers. And we're actually trying to study um, the natural history of chronic pancreatitis and developing a platform um, from which um, uh, basic scientists, translational researchers, and clinicians can study different aspects of pancreatic um, disease. And so there are cohorts developed, there are, there's a control cohort, and there's a suspected chronic pancreatitis cohort that's consisted with a recurrent acute pancreatitis and some other pancreatitis groups, and there's a chronic pancreatitis uh, cohort. And we're just following, we're getting biospecimens, a lot of demographic data, and following these patients over time, and serially collecting uh, data in a very uh, regimented, rigorous uh, way um, to create a very, very rich um, demographics um, data platform, um, biospecimens, imaging repository for us to be able to study and understand uh, pancreatitis and all the caveats associated with, um, with pancreatitis. Early diagnosis, prognosis, and some of the um, extra insufficiency, bone disease, and the other things uh, in chronic pancreatitis. One thing I'll, I'll leave you with is 
where do I think we're going in terms of translational research? So this PROCEED study, uh, we had this green, yellow, and red zone, which is this control group, which is very healthy, uh, healthy people. But then we have a yellow zone where people start to progress to mild to moderate chronic pancreatitis. Then we have this red zone where there's definite chronic pancreatitis. Now, this is, this is our challenge here where um, that Dave, um, in his mechanistic definition, says, you know, this is really like a black box here because, you know, where, where, when do we go from here to here. And that's tough. That's very tough. I've spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. It's hard. So maybe we find it in some of these, you know, proteins, RNA, DNA, cytokines, you know, uh, maybe that's where we find this in some of our samples in our well phenotype patients uh, in the proceed, um, proceed uh, platform. So in conclusions, I'd like to say that um, fecal elastase is what we all pretty much are using, uh, and it has limitations. Don't forget that. Uh, there are challenges for EPI in terms of identifying at-risk patients, diagnosing EPI, and understanding the effectiveness of per therapy. There needs to be an increased awareness of efforts for recognition of EPI. I think um, primarily there's you need to understand that you need about 30,000 um, international units, but you can use a lot in patients a lot of times just to get them uh, corrected. Uh, acid suppression is important if things are not working. I had a patient just um, a couple months ago, longstanding chronic pancreatitis patient, and uh, she just told me that you know, some of her symptoms had changed a little bit, and I uh, kind of said, oh, okay, and she's, I'm doing okay, but I'm kind of bloated a little bit more, and I said, okay, are you taking your enzymes? And she said, yes, and something told me to just do a simple breath test, and it was positive. And um, so that's something to think in mind, is keep in mind is that bacterial overgrowth, they also are predisposed uh, to that. Uh, many patients uh, are not treated or undertreated. Early diagnosis can be very challenging. Monitoring your response to therapy, I'd recommend getting some of those uh, serum uh, markers, retinal binding protein, pre-albumin. Um, and we're trying to retard, retard uh, disease uh, progression with the future uh, drug therapy. And I think it was mentioned yesterday, and I never forget Peter Banks and I went to the um, um, the company that makes um, infliximab, this was, man, this was like, you know, 10 years ago. And we said, can we actually do a small study with infliximab and acute pancreatitis? And they didn't want to do it. But I think, you know, the rheumatologist, infectious disease, I mean, rheumatologist, inflammatory bowel disease, people have drugs that I think we can repurpose for pancreatic uh, disease. I think also the um, hepatologists have drugs in terms of antifibrotic therapy that we can consider repurposing for pancreatic disease. But it's going to take people like you uh, to help us uh, do that. So um, you're getting a lot of good research um, ideas. The only way for us to survive and answer questions for these uh, these patients is that we have to work together because I don't have enough of them. You don't have enough of them. We have to develop collaborative uh, teams and check our egos at the door. And don't worry about who's the first author, who's the last author. Dr. Go will publish all of your papers. Don't worry. Um, he published my first paper. Actually, I will quick have you. Dr. Go published my first paper um, in Pancreas. It was a terrible paper. It was terrible, terrible paper. And um, I submitted that paper, and it was disaster. But it was I was just starting, and I had no mentorship, you know. And so I just so and he actually helped me with the paper uh, and got it and got it published in Pancreas. Well, that was my start uh, there. If you look, you go way back in the catacombs, some of my early public, you'll see it's, it's a terrible paper, terrible. Terrible. I used Excel to make the to make the graphs, and it was it was bad. But anyway, it was on function testing. Um, but anyway, so um, I'm at um, I'm at Ohio State now. I'm, I'm back in Ohio where I, I came from, and having a having a great time. So um, thank you all for for listening, and uh, welcome to the uh, NPF symposium. So I just want to give a brief piece of history to the youngsters. Darwin has been very modest. He's one of the world's experts on this uh, topic. He's also the one who actually invented the endoscopic secreting function test. So he didn't talk about it. And uh, 10, 15 years ago when he was doing it, people were opposing, people were tearing him down, but he insisted, persisted, and it has become a test that uh, other people started. But one thing is, uh, I just wanted to trace the history of drilling tube, where we used to put the tube and give secretin or CCK pancreasamine and measure the things. So gradually people stopped doing it. And about a few years ago, uh, Dr. Forsmark is here, who is, uh, his center is one of the probably the most pioneer, pioneering centers. A few years ago, there were about just four centers in the US using that. Uh, Phil Toskis, Dr. Forsmark Center. 
then Peter Banks Center, Cleveland and Mayo. Then we pulled the plug about two years ago and we took it away because people hardly use it. I just don't know if any center is still remaining. Maybe I think uh, Gainesville. Yeah, um, the answer is nobody uses it. <coughs> um, so I just wanted to, uh, I have a similar comment uh, to Professor Veggie about uh, Darwin Conwell. Uh, back about uh, 30 years ago, or 25, 30 years ago at the American Pancreatic Association meeting, it was very hostile. It was run by pancreatic surgeons that just thought if you weren't a surgeon, you were nothing. And uh, I remember Darwin came to present his research, and he was just butchered. And uh, it was, it was, uh, there was no holding back. And the first problem was he wasn't a surgeon. And the second problem is, is that he didn't train with anybody who was famous. And they just, and he just sat there and listened with a notebook. And every time there'd be a comment, he would write it down and decide that he was going to redo everything again, taking all the stuff into. Uh, into um, account and was able to eventually sort it out and do a good job on his own. But he was persistent and kept his eye on the long-term goal and is really a role model of, of how to do it. Uh, several of us, uh, besides Darwin, suffered the same type of thing and we decided that we, instead of destroying each other, we're going to band together and help each other uh, and that's where the North American Pancreatitis Study Group in came in. And what's so exciting here is to see the result of so many people coming in, opportunities like CAPER that's designed to link people and do big science and those types of things. But uh, uh, I just wanted to shout out to, uh, to uh, Darwin who pulled himself up and struggled through incredible criticism uh, and uh, it turned out to be very successful and makes, uh, made a number of major contributions to the field. So I totally agree with everything said. I'm going to make a pediatric pitch and maybe hopefully highlight on a few points. Maybe Dr. Conwell would be also convinced that pediatricians are probably the right people to study this condition because the most common reason to have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is actually cystic fibrosis. So we as pediatricians see that and they come to us and this is where the role of precision medicine is. I spend a significant amount of referrals really peeling off diagnoses. These kids and babies are given the diagnosis that they have exocrine insufficiency and sometimes they do not. So there are milder variants, we're not going to call them mutations because we don't know yet what they fully do or if you want to call them the variants of unknown clinical significance. And those do not result in EPI right off the bat. but maybe in two or three years, that patient will be. So you would have saved them the hassle um, and help them kind of counsel that patient. The other thing is that um, when you peel the diagnosis, please do not diagnose exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and give labels to patients only based on fecal elastase. So Darwin is nodding his head, thank you. Um, use the tools. We still don't have the perfect test. Ex um, and endoscopic pancreatic function testing, whether you do these, this is the gold standard because it's direct and there are pediatric versions of it and we can go into a debate which version should be used. But even pair it with a secret and enhanced MRCP testing and you actually can get quantitative measures. And we pioneered some protocols around that. There's more data coming for controls and comparing them to exocrine along the spectrum. But it's a very, very hard condition when the patients are coming and they're like, why are we losing weight? You need to tell me, is my pancreas healthy? It's a very tough one. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, one of the things I, I really um, wish I had was blood samples and all the function tests I have done. Because I've, I've done, you know, hundred, hundreds, of maybe, maybe a thousand, I don't know, a lot of pancreas function studies. And I told Dave, I said, I wish I had um, their um, blood samples stored away because I think now we have genetics, we have all this stuff. So I have people with these borderline, I used to have these borderline <coughs> Um, bicarbonates, and I'm saying, what, what is that? You know, what, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And maybe they have some gene mutations, you know, it'd be really nice to study those patients. So I think that's where we're, what we need to think about. The other thing is, um, I, I think for um, 